Hi everyone, this is Ricky Spencer for the Sociology of Media Voices and today I'm speaking to someone whom I admire who has influenced my work as a teacher for English as an additional language and the importance of English language maintenance. Um, he is an anthropologist and a senior research fellow in the Department of Politics and Philosophy. His research focuses on the politics of language endangerment and revitalization with a regional focus on Tibet. He was previously a DECRA fellow at the Australian Institute at the University of Melbourne and a postdoctoral research fellow at Uppsala University's Hugo Valentin Centre. Please welcome Dr. Gerald Roche. Hi, Rickety. Thank you for having me along. Wow. Tell us. Dr. Roche, why is language revitalization and maintenance important? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll just first let me define those terms language, Please. Yes. language maintenance, because it might be something that uh, listeners would be unfamiliar with. Um, so I think especially for people who are English dominant and English monolingual, like um, quite a large number of Australians are. Uh, we have this sense that language, which is just something that exists all, us, all around us and continues to exist um, free, of, free of effort and intervention, free of the state, free of organizing, free of politics, free of power and so on. Um, but the... It, but actually, language is something that requires support in order to continue, right? Uh, people have to speak languages, they have to learn languages, uh, governments have to support them by creating institutional contexts for them to be used and reproduced and so on. And those are the kind of issues that I look at in my research. So language maintenance refers simply to... Uh, continuing to use a language. Revitalization often refers to uh, bringing back a language once it is no longer spoken uh, by a community or, or to support the language when the number of speakers are decreasing. And so the context for this globally is the fact that uh, somewhere between 50 and 90 percent of languages spoken in the world today are currently uh, losing speakers at the expense of dominant languages like English. Mm. And so there is a, a real pressing need around the world to, to, to understand and investigate these issues of uh, how do we help communities hold on to their languages? How do we help communities reclaim their languages? Uh, and the thing that I really emphasize in my work is the relationship uh, between power and those questions and the relationship between those questions and justice. So I see issues of language maintenance and language revitalization uh, as fundamentally issues of social justice. So rather than focusing on the languages themselves, like uh, I focus on their political and social context. So I'm not going in and sort of fiddling around with the grammar and looking at the vocabulary, studying the etymology of words and things like that, that linguists, uh, that linguists would do, but rather as an as a anthropologist and a political anthropologist of languages, I'm really looking at the relationship between language, power, and justice. And that's a really, oh, here's the word, powerful way of explaining why we need to look at this and, and preserve it and, and, and hold on to it. And can you play, can you maybe unpack a little bit through your work in the Tibetan space? Yeah, sure. So, like the basic perspective that I bring to my work is that no one would give up a language that uh, that they were born speaking or that that they learned in their community. No one would give up that language without some form of coercion. So these patterns of people. Um, adopting majority languages and moving away from speaking their language, moving away from transmitting their languages tells us something about patterns of power within society, patterns of coercion within society and patterns of violence. So I've looked at these issues in the Tibetan context. The, the basis of that um, 
was that I, I lived in China, in the Tibetan area of China uh, for eight years. I went there originally as a volunteer for Australian Volunteers International. Uh, worked there as an English teacher, an anthropology teacher, uh, helping not only to uh, teach language, but also helping local people to use language to um, access resources, right? To engage in international development, to interface with uh, international NGOs, to take up opportunities to empower themselves and community. So, uh, you know, this is indicative of the ways that language and power are tied together in another way. Um, but I started working with people in communities there who um, spoke languages that are not recognized by the state, that are not supported by the government in, in any way, that are not included in uh, educational institutions that they cannot use when they go to visit the doctor, that they cannot use when they go to uh, interface with any government services and so on. And uh, what you start to see is that when a government excludes a language, when the government refuses to recognize that language, that creates powerful disincentives for people not only to use that language, but to transmit that language to their children. And what we see happening all across Tibet in a number of um, different contexts with people speaking different languages is parents making this decision to not teach languages to their children because they say, well, this language has made my life harder, right? This language has been a source of exclusion. It's been a source mm. of discrimination. It's been a, a, a source of suffering in my life. So I'm not going to transmit that language to my children. So what I'm interested in is how, how that looks like a choice, right? It looks like they're choosing not to transmit that language, but that choice is being made in a context of massive structural violence, right? And that's what I'm, that's what I'm interested in, in my research in Tibet. So just a few of the sort of the nitty gritty details or the, the, the empirical stuff, there's about 6 million Tibetans inside the People's Republic of China, about 4% mm -hmm. of them, so a quarter of a million Tibetans speak a language which is not Tibetan, so it's a, a minoritized language within Tibetan. So Tibetans are a minority within the Chinese state, and within Tibetans there are these linguistic minorities. There's no um, there's no easy way to sit down and count how many language linguistic minorities there are because there are all sorts of complex debates and politics around the issue of what is and isn't the language, but. Linguists have described about 30 different languages being spoken by Tibetans in addition to the, you know, the Tibetan language. Mm -hmm. And Tibetans themselves recognize this language. There is a Tibetan proverb which goes along the lines of um, every valley has its own river and every village has its own way of speaking, right? So Tibetans have long recognized this diversity. They've long acknowledged that uh, that they uh, speak in different ways in different places, but the state has failed to take that up and now according to survey work that i've done all of these languages are um, all of those minority languages within tibetan are no longer being taught to children or are being taught to children at a declining rate which means probably either in the next generation or the generation following that so the children being born today or their children will no longer be speaking these languages and they will be gone so how do we then preserve languages like this in, in say like 2021, what sort of methods do you consider are effective in some ways of capturing those uh, languages? Yeah, so there's, there's two, two sets of methods I would, um, that, that are sort of talked about in the literature, which I would distinguish between linguistic and political or social methods. Um, and so the linguistic methods really look at things like, um, so first of all, how do, we, how do we document this language? How do we get recordings of it that are effective and meaningful uh, and uh, accurate and detailed enough? How do we describe the grammar and so on of this language? Like, I mean, and this is, this is a sub issue and not one that I really examine in my own research, but the state of linguistic knowledge about the languages of the world is so underdeveloped that the kind of knowledge that we possess about 
how the English language works is just simply not available for the vast majority of the languages of the world. And that in itself sort of um, replicates the way that those languages are oppressed and suppressed, right? If we don't know how a language works, it's very hard to support it institutionally. It's very hard to teach it and so on. So linguists have a really um, important in the work that they do in helping us understand how these languages work. We need that kind of research to support languages and we need more linguists to do research on under-researched languages as well. Mm. Um, but then the other side of it, how do we preserve these languages is really, I would say, um, like the things that I look at, the political angle of it is, the, you know, the question is not necessarily about how do we preserve these languages, but rather how do we preserve people's capacity to choose to use and transmit these languages? How do we create the political conditions um, that either avoid that structural violence that I was talking about? or that enable people to resist that structural violence? Those are the kind of questions that, that I'm really interested uh, in. Um, yeah, so it's really, it, then it, the question becomes completely different. You're no longer thinking about what the language is and how it works, how do we record it, how do we describe it, and how do we teach it? You're focusing instead, your attention is up, you're looking at power, what is power doing? How is that affecting people? How do we help them address that? How do we help them resist that? And those are a different set of questions. Um, but the, to me, they're also a much more interesting set of questions. Mm. I'd, I'd like to kind of explore two things. One is the importance of your work in terms of continuing developing uh, up and coming scholars in your field of work. Perhaps we can do, and then perhaps we can then a little bit uh, dwell into what's happening in um, Indigenous spaces in Australia and the languages there, especially the Torres Strait Islander languages um, and Indigenous languages throughout Australia. So let's now first see what is your area of work and why do we need to still keep investing in the areas of work that you do? Yeah, so, I mean, why do we need to invest in this area? Um, like I would say, particularly in Australia, we have a historical and ethical responsibility to understand this issue in greater detail because of our uh, historical relationships with Indigenous people and, and the extent to which they've just been characterised by violence, exploitation. Mm and you know elimination so like globally so two things first of all is that different political systems oppress languages in different ways and to different extents so for example i do research in china but i'm also interested in the situation in australia mm. the way that languages are oppressed is vastly different in those two different contexts in globally in terms of different political systems and the impact that they have on, on language and people's capacity to use it. Settler colonialism is by far historically and concurrently the most destructive, violent mm. political form when it comes to Indigenous languages. And that's the context that we have in Australia, right? That the levels of lang language elimination in settler colonial societies are far higher than in other political forms, other colonial forms. Mm -hmm. Um, and so Australia has that legacy of being settler colonial, but then we have our own specific uh, niche within that of, 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 again, just being a particularly violent form of settler colonialism, right? Uh, the, you know, the, 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 the massacres, the legacy of the stolen generation, the mission system, and so on. Uh, like, all of that means that the rates of violence against language and destruction of language are particularly high in Australia. So if we, if we look at the uh, pre-colonial levels of linguistic diversity, most, the most recent estimates suggest that there was a little bit over 400 distinct languages spoken in Australia. Um, currently, we, we have a series of national surveys which track uh, indigenous languages, the extent to which they're still being used and spoken 
uh, transmitted and so on. And I think we have something like 12 or 13 languages in Australia, which are still considered uh, strong, right? Mm -hmm. So they're widely used, used across all generations, used in a variety of social contexts, still transmitted to children and so on. So if you think about that number, 12 languages versus 406. We just, we have this absolutely appalling, violent, destructive history, which was, which is part of our broader appalling, violent, destructive history. Right. Mm. And, and to me, addressing that is part of the necessary work of decolonization and reconciliation. It's part of the obligations that Australian people have to indigenous uh, people there's i th i think there's there's no other necessary motive for that work other than the ethical obligations that we have um, from my perspective right um so then globally how does that fit into the broader yes um, picture right um well i would say that in uh, what to say there are a bunch of different justifications for why language revitalization is important. People will say things like uh, multilingualism improves cognitive function, a language revitalization creates greater social cohesion and stability and so on. But for me, the really the only important justifications are, are ethical and in relation to social justice. Like the fact that we we are living through this period in history which is linguistically unique because of the mass destruction of languages around the world. To me, that this is a, an, an, an indicator of the massive uh, political inequalities that exist all around us. And addressing this issue of language maintenance and language revitalization is another way of addressing those inequalities and creating a more just world. And to me, those, those, that, that's the reason why we need to do this work. Uh, so long as this work is necessary, that's indicative of the fact that we're living in an unjust world. Mm. So with your work in, in, say, 2021, what is the future for future anthropologists who want to specialise in examining power and colonial settler um, interactions that have occurred and are occurring, we should mm -hmm. say, because sometimes people think it's all in the past. But yeah. can you perhaps clarify that in terms yeah. of that, how it's... Is it something that just sits in the past or do you mm -hmm. see this as a fluid uh, process that is continually going through? Yeah. So two of the areas of theory that I work with are post-colonial theory and settler colonial uh, theory, right? And both of them are kind of predicated on this idea of the ongoing nature of colonial domination. And they have different ways of emphasizing, emphasizing that. But to me, I think that that's one of the most important contributions that anthropology has to make to our understanding ending of contemporary power relations mm. is that colonialism is a contemporary practice for me one of the things that really kind of helped me perceive this was the experience of living um living in china and working with tibetan people i think uh, you know growing up in australia uh, having a sense of indigenous history and so on uh, like, I don't think we teach these things, especially at least when and where I was growing up in primary school, in high school, in university, the idea that these are ongoing relations is not really something that I acquired as a kid, right? Mm -hmm. Going in China, like one of the, one of the things that's advantageous about going and living in another country, going to study in another country, going to learn somewhere else is that things take on a level of clarity, right? Working with Tibetans in China, it was just very obvious most of the time what was going on china was an occupying force tibetans were an oppressed people that suffused every aspect of people's lives mm -hmm. and um and 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 you know and even when it was not a even like in the context of tibetan people uh experiencing a certain level of prosperity and economic development uh 
you can still see that those relations of domination and violence exist everywhere despite that, right? And then coming back to Australia and learning to see that in our law, in, in my daily lives here, has kind of been one of the most, I think, important intellectual and perceptual achievements of my life. And I just never would have got that if I hadn't gone to live somewhere else, right? And so the question then sort of pedagogically is how do you give someone that experience without sending them off to live outside the country for a decade? And that's an important challenge. But I think that that's one of the key things that uh, anthropology has to offer is sort of to be able to give people an understanding where they can like turn around like I am now, look out the window, see a very pleasant suburban setting and say, this is colonialism, mm. this is domination, this is violence, mm. right? Uh, but but I think if we, you know, if we actually care about making a more just and equitable world and a more just and equitable country, we have to learn to see things in this way. Um, in terms of like the future of doing this kind of study and thinking in this way, um, like there are so many challenges to doing, to continuing to think in this way in the contemporary university. Like for one, if you look at the work that I do, which sits across anthropology, a little bit of linguistics, uh, you know, I draw from a bunch of fields, right? Mm -hmm. Linguistics, anthropology, area studies in Asia, uh, indigenous studies, et cetera, et cetera. Like it's very difficult to be interdisciplinary in the contemporary university we're encouraged to be interdisciplinary but we're not employed to be interdisciplinary mm -hmm. right you're employed uh primarily to teach and to teach disciplines so the more interdisciplinary you are the harder it is to really get a a foothold in the contemporary university and then like you know we've just had this gradual creeping rational economic rationalization of university operations which means that everyone and everything that's done in the university has to be economically profitable, right? If you consider economic profit to be part of the systems of violence that create an unjust world, then you're stuck in this loop, right? Of being dependent on the system that you're trying to critique and that is trying to, uh, like, you, you, you inevitably become a subject of the violence you're trying to describe to some extent as well. Um, so I, I think it, increasingly it's important to find spaces outside the university where we can uh, teach, think about and discuss these issues as well. I, but, you know, I continue to hope that there will be spaces in the university where we can have these uh, crucial, critical conversations and to continue to encourage to uh, encourage students and to encourage each other as academics to to confront the ongoing violence of the Australian colonial context. Dr. Roche, it has been an absolute pleasure hearing your lived experience and your work that you're doing for our communities. Thank you. Um, I can only hope that we take on board everything that you have done and that people in power had realised and it's, it's up to us, the audience, students, academics, to really support and fight for people like Dr Roche to be employed so that future students, especially in the, in the areas of Indigenous rights and Indigenous policy makers, really look at why we need to reconsider, you know, really exploring in more detail why language revitalisation maintenance you know, is part, you know, of was a, or is a part of um, the continuing um, violence and ways of control that, um, you know, post-colonial people who are in power, in privilege, are using as a weapon to weaponize. Thank you so much for this very thoughtful interview.